thanks for coming out today. I uh, really appreciate it to uh, uh, listen to uh, the results of some of the research I've been doing on new technologies and how uh, changes in technologies are really shaping the international political environment. And the core question that a lot of my research focuses on is this, this sort of big one, is how, you know, how will the information age reshape or affect international politics? And I mean, obviously it does in, in ways that are, that are pretty obvious already. I mean, anybody that has a, a smartphone, and you know, I mean, I'm sure there are some people here checking them right now, uh, understands the way that you know, technology that would have seemed you know, wacky and unbelievable even when you know, somebody like Gene Roddenberry was inventing Star Trek now seems you know, kind of commonplace and obvious. And that's something that affects, you know, some things like smartphones affect everything from you know, how we interact with each other to how, how governments interact, giving people and governments the opportunities to communicate, for example, in ways that they never have been able to before. Uh, but today, I don't want to talk about smartphones. I want to talk about a couple, of other a couple of other emerging technologies and how they're shaping warfare. And I want to animate it at the beginning with uh, a shot of this uh, movie, which uh, the interview, which if not for North Korea hacking Sony Pictures and threatening uh, essentially terrorist style attacks on any movie theaters that, that showed it, n no one might have heard of it. I mean, I saw it, it's kind of funny, but I have sort of a juvenile sense of humor. I have a totally juvenile sense of humor. Uh, and so I thought it was funny, but I suspect many people in the room wouldn't think it was funny, but a lot, a lot more people actually watched this than probably would have, really because the North Koreans told us not to. But so what happened in this particular case? You had a foreign government that hacked the American subsidiary of a Japanese company and then threatened a uh, kinetic potential, like a physical attack, on the territory of the United States if that, movie, uh, if that movie was shown. This is not something you generally learn about in an international security 101 kind of class. We, we've known that you know, cyber war, cyber conflicts were, were coming, that this was a, sort of a big deal for a long time. But when we traditionally think about cyber and what it means for the international political environment, we tend to think about it in terms of protecting uh, our networks or attacking other people's or attacking other people's networks. This raises all sorts of questions, though, about war and peace. So North Korea hacks, uh, you know, Sony uh, Sony Pictures, and you know, costs them a bunch of money. You know, threatens uh, threatens potential violence. Even even put aside the threat of violence. We know that the appropriate response to that, or we decide that the appropriate response to that is not, say, to bomb North Korea. Well, why? If North Korea had dropped a bomb on Sony Pictures, North Korea would have attacked American soil. We would have, it'd be a perfectly reasonable response to bomb North Korea. But it's not. To, you know, when, they hack, when they hack Sony Pictures and cost them a lot of money, what is the line with a, with a new technology where especially a non-kinetic new technology, where the destruction caused by that technology is enough that it warrants a, a physical response, actually you know, reaching out and touching somebody. It's just one of the questions that this kind of technology uh, raises. And what I want to talk about today is not just sort of those sorts of issues, but also what it means for the United States. Since the United States, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate, obviously, to all be in the United States, and the United States is the wealthiest, most powerful country in the world, in large part because the American military is the most powerful military in the world. But when is it that big powers struggle? When is it that traditional powers often face risk? It's precisely during periods where new technologies are introduced that threaten their core competencies. Just like large businesses can fail, during transitions in the, in the technologies that, that they need to succeed. So to understand this, we have to take a step back and understand how it is that new innovations actually spread. And for, I've seen a couple of you uh, here, I've seen in class before, this chart will look uh, probably familiar to you. This is what's called a cumulative adopter function. And on the left here, we have the, the total number of adopters of a new technology, whether it's an iPhone, whether it's a micro, microwave, whether it's a fancy yogurt that you buy at Whole Foods, you know, whatever. And on the bottom, we have the time since you know, it was invented. 
And most innovations tend to fall, in all innovations, basically follow this curve. You have something that's invented, and you have kind of early adopters, like the cool kids, you know, picking it up. And then you have a takeoff point where a new technology or new way of doing business spreads throughout society. And then you have the slowdown point. This is the point where like everybody's grandparents has an iPhone. And the technologies that I want to talk about today and some of the issues that I want to talk about today are, are things that I think are right here. They're right at the takeoff point. They're, they're technologies and things that exist in the world. We know what they are. Some people are, are figuring out what to do. But there's still a lot of uncertainty about what, uh, what these technologies will mean for international politics and the international security environment. And I want to talk about uh, a, couple things, uh, a couple things in particular. We need to understand what kind of innovations new technologies, new practices are. After all, different sorts of innovations spread differently. You know, the iPhone spread very quickly. Something like, say, nuclear weapons, on the other hand, spread very slowly. Nuclear weapons, after all, are really expensive. They require very particular uh, things, say plutonium or enriched uranium, that can be kind of hard to get. And it's proven actually pretty complicated for countries to you know, build nuclear weapons, although, I mean, if North Korea could build one, I mean, like, you know, maybe anybody could. Uh, in the middle, you have something like fighter aircraft, something, you know, advanced fighter aircraft, something that is reasonably difficult to build, but, but certainly not impossible. And so over time, you know, the technology is invented. And then over time, most of the countries in the world that want advanced fighter aircraft can, you know, get something, you know, more or less. But, it, you know, it takes a little while. Finally, we have something that you can pick up on basically in basically any city in the world, including the United States, for better or worse, and that's an AK-47 which is the most ubiquitous rifle in the world and is an example of a technology where the barriers to entry to that technology were extremely low. And so it spread rapidly. So when we think about some of the new technologies and some of the ones that I'm going to talk about, specifically advances in uh, robotics and autonomous systems and a little bit more about, uh, about cyber, what we want to understand is what kind of innovation these new technologies actually are. And I think that there are two key trends that suggest, at least to me, that these technologies and the way that they spread throughout the world are, are likely to be a lot more like the AK-47 than like nuclear weapons. The first is that what we're talking about fundamentally with all the things I'm going to talk about today are, are software innovations. They're not like the military technologies that, that you know, helped the US get ahead during the Cold War. We're not talking about big aircraft carriers or tanks or bombers or even stealth technology. We're talking about pr things that you're programming rather than big platforms. The second is that we're talking about technologies where there's enormous commercial interest. The technologies that's, that often spread much you know, more slowly throughout the world are technologies that have really high unit costs, so say something like nuclear weapons, and things where the primary application uh, for them, and in some ways the only application, is military. And that, uh, say, like stealth technology. <coughs> Whereas things with an underlying commercial incentives are likely to spread much faster. And I think the challenge, especially when we turn to robotics, is that the market size for commercial robotics is likely to far outstrip military investments, suggesting that attempts to regulate, restrict the spread of these technologies are likely to fail. And we need to be thinking more about adapting to that world rather than trying to uh, prevent it. So let's start by talking about uh, robotics. All right, so we, you know, we have the happy kind of like ET, you know, ET kind of image here. And, but when I say robotics, just to be clear, I'm not talking about drones. You know, when you think about military robotics, generally you think about drones, the drones with, you know, fearsome names like the Predator and the Reaper that the U.S. uses around the world to, uh, to conduct surveillance on and sometimes attack uh, those that threaten the United States. And, you know, these are the things that are in the news and that generate protests. But these systems are actually very limited. They're really slow. They're not very stealthy. They can't really protect themselves. They're really easy to track. There's a reason why we use drones in places like Afghanistan, Yemen, et cetera. It's because we're using them in places where people can't fight back against them. Because anybody with any air defense you know, worth just about anything could, could shoot down a drone because they're really slow. So we're not, I'm not going to talk about this kind of technology, although I think it's interesting. Happy to take questions about it. 
what I want to talk about are the things that I think are coming next and, and, what, those, uh, and what those really mean. So this is more about where things are going. Which leads to the question then, what will drive innovation in robotics and thus in military robotics? Here we have uh, you know, four pictures of different uh, robots. This is a Toyota invented uh, violin playing robot just to show they could. This is uh, essentially a robotic hamburger manufacturer, which is delicious. Uh, this is Baxter with the creepy eyes, who's a manufacturing robot. And then this is the, you know, if anybody, it's unlikely any of you has one of these, but it's entirely, does anybody have a Roomba? Uh, you know, produced by iRobot, which reported earnings yesterday, did terribly. They're down like 10% this morning. But the Roomba is probably the best known commercial robot out there. It's a robotic vacuum cleaner. And over the last decade, what we've seen with something like the Roomba is it originally went from not being able to clean corners and not being able to sort of do much of anything at a very high price point. The price of the Roomba is coming down. The capabilities of the Roomba are getting better. And now more competitors are entering that kind of market. So you have all of this commercial innovation in this technology that has nothing to do with what militaries around the world might be interested in. This is the Atlas robot, which was originally built by a company called Boston Dynamics. It was designed for the purposes of disaster relief. So a DARPA, the R&D arm of the Defense Department, uh, held this competition where they were trying to uh, get companies to think about building robots that could help with something like, say, earthquake relief. So um, remember the earthquake that happened in Haiti a couple of years ago? You have people trapped in rubble, and first responders can't get to them. Wouldn't it be great if you had uh, a robot that was 6'2", weighed 330 pounds, could toss rubble away to, so first responders could get to people and save lives. That sounds terrific. Now put a couple of machine guns on the ends of the arm of the Atlas. Totally different technology now, or it seems like a totally different technology. And these are all sort of robots that were funded by the Defense Department. Uh, the, the big dog is supposed to carry the packs of soldiers, uh, so uh, so when people like this guy are, you know, wandering around, uh, wandering around Afghanistan, that they're not weighed down too much by all of their equipment. Uh, the cheetah is supposed to run really fast. It's unclear to me what else it's supposed to do. But the Boston Dynamics built all these technologies funded by the Defense Department. Google bought Boston Dynamics. So why is Google buying robotics companies? Google also bought... Uh, a company called Shaft, which was a Japanese company that, that entered a robot in the same competition that that Atlas robot was in. And in total, Google's purchased over a dozen robotics companies uh, over the last 18 months. And the Defense Department, so Google buys a company like Boston Dynamics, and, and Google, uh, uh, Defense Department goes to Google and says, hey, are, are you guys still going to do these defense contracts and you know, work with us on military robotics? And Google says, no, that's OK. Defense Department, you know, representative says, is, do you not like us? You know, is, is, do you have a problem with the American military? And Google's like, no, we think the military's great. But uh, we think that there's a lot more value for these engineers in doing work on robotics outside the military sector. The U.S. defense budget is enormous. It's enormous. If Google thinks that the opportunities in robotics, in the commercial sector, in the private sector, are so big that it makes the US, U.S. defense market not worth it for them to invest in. What does that say about the likely size of the commercial robotics market over the next generation? To me, it says it's going to be enormous and that there's not much you can do about it because it's technology that Google is building and exporting that's purely commercial technology. That's not the kind of technology that you're really going to be able to, say, slap an export control on and make it so nobody else can get it. It's not the kind of technology whose spread you're really going to be able to uh, prevent. So you have that big commercial driver pushing innovation in robotics. Then you have this. This is the MQ-9 Reaper. It's the state of the art for armed drones operated by the American military. So keep this picture in mind. And now uh, take a look at this. It's the Wing Lung. It's a Chinese drone that looks uh, surpri surprisingly like the uh, MQ-9 Reaper that China debuted at the Paris Air Show, the sort of biggest air show in the world, in June uh, 2013, purportedly with the same sorts of capabilities that something like the Reaper uh, has, demonstrating that 
We've thought of military robotics and especially things like drones as a unique and special snowflake that we have, like we United States, we have, that other countries don't have. But this, along with a lot of developments by the Israelis and a bunch of other countries, suggests that if there was any American monopoly on military robotics, it is long gone. So China does this, then the US says, all right, well, anything you can do, we can do better. And the next month, this is new, we're now in summer 2013, the next month, uh, the US tests for the first time something called the X-47B, which is a next generation, a naval drone that can uh, take off from and land on aircraft carriers. Taking off from and landing on an aircraft carrier is basically the hardest thing for a pilot to do in the world. That uh, a computer program could do that is sort of unbelievable. And this is a next generation American drone designed to fix some of those shortcomings that I mentioned before. It's faster, it looks like it could be a little stealthier, it can carry more weapons, a lot more capable. So the US tests this, and, and there's still some questions over whether this will actually get built, actually, but the US tests this. And China, uh, a couple months later, uh, tests this, which is called the Sharp Sword. It's the, uh, this is the first uh, test flight of a, a Chinese stealth UAV, a Chinese stealth drone. Now, will this enter production and you know, will, will we see it flying around all the time anytime soon? Probably not. But the point being that this is not just something then that, so you know, I said before the commercial market's huge and the commercial market is huge, but it's not just that the commercial market is huge, it's that for the same sorts of reasons that countries around the world for you know, hundreds, you know, thousands of years have attempted to one-up each other when it comes to developing and deploying the best you know, technologies in the world, that's happening in this space as well. It's not just China, it's also Israel, it's also the, it's also the EU, it's also uh, other countries in the Middle East. Uh, Iran has claimed to build a drone kind of like this, although it looks like it, it's made of plastic or styrofoam or something, but I'm sure it works. But point being, there's lots of military interest in this technology, uh, in this technology as well. Because, well, military uh, robots have a lot of capabilities that you, you might want to use. You know, for example, if you send a drone instead of a person, well, now you don't have to put your soldiers at risk. And especially, say, if you're a military like the United States that invests a lot in its soldiers, then you really want to try to keep your soldiers alive. To say nothing of, you know, you want to, would like to keep them alive in general. But then that makes this, in some ways, just the tip of, uh, this just the tip of the iceberg. And that military robotics are not just about drones. They're not just about the sort of airplanes that we think about. This is a, a US naval program to develop a drone that could clear uh, mines in something like the, the Persian Gulf, where US ships could be threatened. Uh, this is an Israeli uh, remotely driven um, border guard robot to uh, prevent infiltrations of the Israeli border. Uh, this is an Iranian, uh, essentially, a missile, missile, one-way missile boat. So imagine, uh, you know, if you ever played with like a remote-controlled boat or something, if you were on, like, on a lake or something as a, as a kid, imagine a lot of those loaded with explosives, you know, headed towards an American aircraft carrier. So this isn't just about drones. It's not just about the, the, you know, the predator and the reaper and things that we see in the news. I mean, even imagine more mundane uses. Like if you're, say, the United States deployed in a place like Afghanistan, and you have lots of soldiers who have, who have died or been injured doing various sort of transportation tasks, why not use robots for that? Why, do you, why not just remotely pilot trucks going back and forth between military bases with supplies? Why do you need people on those trucks? Or if you're flying cargo planes, that really never crash. Why do there have to be pilots for those cargo planes? And those are trends then that are, are dual use. And by, and by that I mean, say something like flying cargo planes remotely, clear military application, military has cargo planes. What about FedEx? What about UPS? What about the US Postal Service? I mean, they might get, be last in the innovation front, but the, that's, the Postal Service is great. But the, that actually makes me, sorry, that makes me think of Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, in, the, in the end when, they, you know, when they're doing the trial and they, you know, they prove that Chris Kringle and Santa Claus and they, and they do it in part because the prosecution concedes that you know, the prosecution believes that the US Postal Service is you know, second to none in you know, its efficiency and innovation and effectiveness. 
That always cracks me up. <laughs> um, the, anyway, point being, there are lots, there's lots of innovation going on in this sector, and it's not just in the types of technology that we've come to, to think about. So the question then, I want to leave you with in this particular section, is whether or not today's experiments, experiments will be tomorrow's warriors. This is the Kuroda. It was a, a Japanese, uh, it was a publicity stunt, basically, by a Japanese company. It worked, because I'm still talking about it two and a half years later, where they took, uh, you know, basically they took a robot, they rolled it into some sort of expo, and you'll note, if you look really closely, that those look like sort of weapons on its arms. Now, those weapons are like BB guns and like Nerf shooters and things like that. But the point was, this technology is not 30 years away technology. This is now technology. And the question is, do countries wish to use it or not? And when is it that countries will decide to deploy these sorts of things? All right, next thing I want to talk about, uh, just for a minute. Uh, I want to go back to where I started and thinking about the, uh, you know, thinking about the interview, thinking about a cyber kind of technology. Since I think that cyber, and I put myself in this category, is one of the least well understood technologies. If, if you, one could even think about something like the Internet of Things as a particular technology when it's in some ways a combination of technologies. And that if you, if you imagine the range of of new technologies coming down the pipe that you know, one could toss into a presentation like this. You have robotics, you have nanotechnology, you have three-dimensional printing, you know, there are lots of, lots of things. Cyber, in some ways, is the least well understood because all of those other things are things that exist in the physical world in a, in, in whose manifestation is pretty obvious. A cyber attack, on the other hand, is a lot less clear, and I think there are three dichotomies when it comes to uh, cyber technology and what it means for international politics that we're still sort of wrapping our minds around. The first is the question of industry versus government, which you saw in the case of the interview. So the US military, the US government spends you know, hundreds of millions, maybe billions of dollars every year trying to protect American networks. You know, when I worked in the Pentagon and email went down, you know, everyone would joke around about how like, the Russians or the Chinese must have done it. But the, you know, the U.S. spends a lot of money, it's pretty good, at defending its networks. So, and that's clearly a government expense. You know, the, the government should be paying money to defend government networks for attack, from attack. But, so now the government, I mean, the U.S. government is contracting with, say, a Lockheed, a defense contractor, to build a weapon system. Well, if, uh, say, another country looking to steal plans for a new weapon hacks Lockheed, and takes those plans, that hurts, you know, that, that hurts the government. So should the government be paying for Lockheed cybersecurity then? Maybe not, but then should, should the government have then clear standards for Lockheed cybersecurity? Maybe. Now, what about other sorts of, what about, in, what about other sorts of industries? What about, th say, things like power plants, or hospitals, or Sony Pictures? All things who, where, a cyber attack can have significant economic or even physical consequences, but where the role of government in regulating and deciding, say, what standards should be, what regulation should look like, is very, is very unclear, and, and where the technology and how to utilize that technology is also, uh, is also a bit unclear. And in part, you know, think about the reaction to the Edward Snowden uh, revelations about NSA spying with the direction of that in some ways. So on the one hand, what I just described to you is an argument essentially for why the United States government should care a lot about basically every, com every company in America's cybersecurity. The, the reaction to Snowden, of course, is, is the opposite, which is the government should be staying away. So how do you, how do you integrate those two uh, perspectives? Also, how do you square the circle of offense versus defense? It's all well and good to say we should protect, you know, a you know, government should protect its own networks, a company should protect its own networks. At what point is it okay to launch attacks yourselves, yourself? We understand this very well in the military context. There are, you know, laws of war that govern when it's okay to use military force, when it's okay to, to fire, a, you know, fire a rifle, fire a missile, etc. What does that look like in the cyber, cyber realm? It's a lot less certain. 
The Stuxnet virus is an example of this, potentially. The Stuxnet virus, of course, was a virus uh, allegedly created by the Israelis in the United States, or the Israelis and, and double allegedly the United States, to uh, take down uh, a piece of Iran's uh, nuclear weapons development program. And it was very successful and, and considered one of the, the you know, biggest, uh, a, a great example of a cyber attack that did not just have virtual consequences, not just like a computer went on, offline, but had physical consequences in that a bunch of centrifuges that Iran was spinning around broke. So what is the line then between when does a cyber attack become so consequential that it merits a kinetic or physical response using traditional military force? This is something that Estonia had to deal with when, it's, when facing a cyber attack by the Russians. This is something that Georgia had to deal with when facing a cyber attack by the Russians. And it all sounded well and good and very theoretical until the interview controversy happened. And then lots of things that, including when I was in the Pentagon, you'd sort of sit around and discuss, what should we do in thinking about responding to a cyber attack? All of a sudden, it's become a lot more real. And, and to be clear, I'm not going to give you the answer, because I don't, if, I, if I had one, I would give it to you. But there isn't a clear answer about what it should be, because there are no established standards. And there are no established standards about what that line is. When is it that virtual destruction is enough? That even if you can't respond in kind, I mean, one way to think about it is proportionality. Say somebody hits you, somebody hacks your network, then you have the right to hack their network, but not do more than that. But what if someone hacks your network and takes a power plant offline, or and takes a hospital offline, and 100 people die? Is it OK to then drop a bomb on their country and kill 100 people? I don't know. No, really, like, I don't know. And these are questions that, that, that you know, if some of you have, have thoughts, I'd love to hear them, that we, like, we United States, we, and, you know, we people, we need to think about because there are no standards and rules right now. This is something that's very much in flux. Last thing I want to talk about is the scariest one. Or, I mean, many people believe it's the scariest one. I mean, when the robots think for themselves, I mean, so before we talk about military robotics, that are, they're all remotely piloted. When the robots think for themselves in the movies, it's never good. I mean, Terminator, Matrix, 2001, A Space Odyssey. I mean, WALL-E is about all you got for, uh, you know, the robot thinks, and it's great. Uh, it, like, it doesn't go well. So what happens when robots with weapons get to think for themselves? Uh, as the Defense Department would like to call them, uh, you know, lethal autonomous weapon systems, or as NGOs and activists would like to call them, killer robots. And you can see here, for those of you that care about language, the way that um, you know, the language matters here and how you describe the system, and that one of them, the acronym is LAWS, lethal autonomous weapon systems. That's not a coincidence. And you know, the other, it's killer robots. I mean, come on, guys. All right, so what are we talking about? What are killer robots? It's actually a little more complicated than you'd think. This is the Defense Department's definition of a killer robot. It's a weapon system that, once activated, can select and engage targets without further intervention. So well, we know what we think we mean an autonomous weapon system is. It's, you know, it's, maybe something, it's maybe something like the Terminator. It's something where you, know, you say, you know, go kill bad guys, and it goes off and kills bad guys. But, or, or hopefully just kills bad guys. But, you know, of course, what's the thing that, say, activists concerned about uh, this technology are worried about? What they're worried about is, say, uh, robots on the ground trying to, say, clear a house that has insurgents in it. And you bust into the house, and there are insurgents, and there's little Susie. And the robot can't tell the difference between the insurgent and little Susie, and so, you know, kills a bunch of civilians. Now, one question is, if the robot's actually programmed correctly, is the robot more likely to kill civilians than scared 18-year-old kids? I don't know. It's an imperial. I mean, our, our soldiers are the best in the world, but even they make mistakes. Soldiers in lots of places make mistakes. And that, that, in some ways, is an empirical question. But for a lot of people, there's something that just seems icky about the idea of, of robots killing people. Now, we can go really far and talk about robots killing robots. But, but, that's a, that's a different sort of, but that's a different sort of thing. And so you have the, the potential development of these 
new sorts of autonomous weapon systems. So if these are clearly uh, uh, scary in a way, and we'd worry about, all right, can these systems be used safely and, and reliably? You know, forget you know, Skynet, things like that. Why is it that, well, you, you know, want them anyway? You know, after all, you have, these, you have these ethical and moral issues. You have both the, the concern that they won't, you know, they won't do a good job, but that it's impossible to program a robot, say, to have empathy. Or it's impossible to program to have a robot recognize targets well enough. I mean, that's not necessarily true, given that if you think about the way that the uh, GPS-guided bombs and other sorts of things that, that the US and other countries have actually work, or radar guided, uh, or radar guided technology, but you know there's the the sort of moral ethical issue. You know, as one activist has said, is there a right to be killed with dignity by another person? You know, then you have practical issues as well, and I want to I want to talk about these practical issues for a minute. In that, why is it that anyone would want the robots thinking for themselves? Well, I can I can tell you three situations. One, defense. This is called a, a phalanx. It's a, a mis, it's a gun system that goes on US ships for the most part that's designed to protect ships from incoming missiles in, in, you know, in, in, other, in other sorts of threats. Well, this system has an automatic mode because suppose there's so many things coming in to attack a US ship or, or, some, other, uh, countries, uh, or some other country's ship that has this system that a person doesn't have the reaction time to be able to target each one of them independently. So instead, you flip on automatic mode, it takes out the threats, and you save the ship. So now you've saved a bunch of lives. That's maybe one reason why you'd want these systems in some instances. There might be offensive reasons as well. This will be a little more controversial, which is that suppose you're, you're fighting in a conflict. You know, think about the way that the American military and most advanced militaries around the world fight, which is in a networked fashion. You know, networked fashion with real-time communication and massive data, data streams. What if, for example, in a future conflict, satellites went offline, either because they're hacked or because they're destroyed? There might be some practical advantages to having systems deployed that could still accomplish their mission even if you can't communicate with them anymore. Or to put it even more simply, suppose you're just flying a, a drone to, to attack, uh, you know, attack a target in another country and the drone is attacked. Should it have the ability to fight back? Not sure. Third reason, and this is the most basic one, we got a shot here of Kennedy and Khrushchev from the Cold War, you know, it's keeping up with the Joneses. And that's, all right, so suppose you're the United States and you decide, all right, we have the best military in the world, we're all good, we're going to be fine, we are not going to develop these kinds of weapon systems because other countries, uh, you know, we're not going to develop these kinds of weapon systems because we think that it's wrong. And then the U.S. ends up in a conflict where the American Air Force flying, you know, F-22s and they figure out the F-35, you know, F-35s, you know, are up in the air and we're shooting down enemy systems at a ratio of uh, eight to one. So you know, our pilots are way better than the, than the, you know, than the other side's uh, Air Force. But suppose the other side, there are no people in those cockpits. Those are autonomous weapon systems swarming together. And we can take them down at an eight to one rate, but the cost differential in building them is 30 to one. And that they can build 30 of those platforms for every one really expensive, very excellent fighter that the United States can build. That is a cost curve that the United States would be on the losing side of. And so that's an incentive for why countries are, or even, even if they thought these systems were not the, you know, have concerns, why some countries might still be interested in investing in them. So then, why not make this easy? There is a, a, a human rights um, sort of led campaign to, uh, led by Human Rights Watch in part, to to ban killer robots. So let's just stop these before they start. Why won't that work? Maybe it will. Here's one problem. Remember that picture I showed you before, the MQ-9 Reaper? How could you tell whether that is a remotely piloted drone or a killer robot? It's software, going back to the very beginning, it's software, not hardware, that would distinguish between the two of those things. 
which means the traditional way that we've thought about doing things like arms control, which is you know, count how many nuclear weapons the US has, count how many nuclear weapons Russia has, and be like, all right, you met the rules. That wouldn't work in this kind of case. How would you actually verify that anyone would follow this? And who would actually agree to a ban? Here's a problem. The United States is the best in the world. So if you freeze military technology exactly where it is today, who's the country that benefits the most? The United States. Countries that would not benefit? Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and any even American allies that seek to get better, say, say Japan, South Korea, uh, uh, India, et cetera. So there are lots of countries, including the countries that are in some ways the, the largest concern when it comes to you know, who's interested in building up their military, that might not agree uh, to such a ban. Which then leads to, I think, the takeaway question here, how should we think about the costs and benefits of letting the robots think for themselves? There are obviously some risks, there are obviously some disadvantages, but what happens if we, you know, if we decide not to and everybody else does it anyway, except for Costa Rica, because they'll agree to ban anything, because they got rid of their military. No, really, if you want to ban some weapons, the best way to do it is to, uh, you, know, you can always get Costa Rica to uh, you know, nominate your proposal to ban something. Great country. No, it is. I mean, I, mean, I really want to visit. Tell my wife. All right, so what does this mean for the United States? Uh, I'll wrap up with that. Military superiority is not an American birthright. You know, we have pictures here of the uh, Prince of Wales, which is a British battleship uh, sunk by the Japanese at the outset of World War II, demonstrating the end, essentially, of British naval, uh, British naval superiority, something which had been taken for granted for you know, a little over 100 years. Here we have the debut of the longbow, the decline of the night. When the longbow debuted on the battlefield, it was called unfair, unfair because it could penetrate the armor of uh, knights, and then the knights couldn't, you know, then they wouldn't be able to, you know, get to the battlefield. Yeah. Sorry, guys. These sorts of changes happen. And the concern, if you're, say, somebody, if you're somebody like me and thinking about it, if you're thinking about it from an American perspective, the concern is that these platforms, these things that have made the United States the best in the world, if the United States does not invest sufficiently in the next generation of technologies, you know, that could be the United States in the future. Now, I don't think it will be because I think the United States is, is, is committing, it's, is attempting to commit itself to investing in these new technologies and, and in changing its military. But this is, a, this, is an, this is a live risk. This is an active issue and it's something that isn't going anywhere and where the United States cannot afford to stand still because other countries, as I hope I've persuaded you, both for military reasons and for commercial reasons, Google's gonna spread this technology around the world. And so there's not a lot the United States can do except try to stay ahead. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions. I think there's certainly some truth to that. The, uh, working with the um, American military is certainly not easy from a procurement perspective. And uh, that, that certainly could be a factor. But I mean, part of it, if you look at the, I mean, just look at the reports that came out after that uh, little um, uh, phantom drone landed on the White House lawn uh, last week and, and reports of expansions in you know, uh, agricultural drones and uh, forest monitoring drones, like environmental monitoring kind of drones. I mean, the. The, the market's certainly growing. I think the democratization of technology in some ways should be, is one of the takeaways from this, and that's something that applies to cyber technology as well as, uh, as, well as robotics. I mean, I mean, what's one of the questions that I think you know, many people had after the, after the Sony hack? All right, it could be North Korea, or it could be North Korea contracted out to, uh, to another organization, and I mean, you know, given our biases about what North Korea can and can't do, in some ways the latter seems more plausible from, you know, I think the perspective of many, uh, of many Americans. And it's certainly if you look at Anonymous and what, you know, what they've done, I mean, the, uh, I think the, the growth in capabilities of non-state actors is not, 
is not, is, not a, is not a brand new story, but I think many people uh, are going to be surprised by what even pretty small non-state, violent non-state actors can do, either criminal or violent non-state actors can do over the next generation. I mean, so say, take a group like uh, Hezbollah, which is one of the most, you know, competent in that, you know, like good at what they do, uh, violent non-state actors in the world, you know, operating primarily out of Lebanon. Well, Hezbollah now operates uh, some drones. And, and, and does so for drones they got from Iran, and they, you know, they do so, allegedly got from Iran, and they do so pretty well. But, you know, if, if I can jump on Amazon and buy a drone for, you know, 300 bucks that, that, flies, pretty, that flies pretty well, and, you know, the cost for those things keeps dropping, everybody's going to be able to do that. And, you know, similarly in, in the cyber domain, I mean, while I think the, you know, the, the old, like, anybody with a modem could, you know, take out the eastern seaboard thing is probably a little overrated, in part because of work that people in cybersecurity have done to make it a little harder, I think it's certainly true that there's nothing about, you know, the advantages of nation states in generating destructive capacity have to do with the ability to mass and you get more things together and the ability to invest to develop new stuff. And that doesn't necessarily hold in the cyber realm, which means we should expect that non-state actors will have capabilities that are relatively equivalent to what nation states can do. So didn't the army like implement like the cyber warfare command? So that blurring line, do you think the army may be pushing that blurred or blurring it on its own? I think that the uh, cyber command is a, you know, the newest US command and it's an, it's an attempt to think through these things. I mean, I, I think there's not, uh, I don't think it's a question of blurring as in the, you know, there's something pernicious going on. I think it's more, I think it's more like trying to figure out, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, in part from a military perspective, when it, when it, when it comes to offensive cyber attacks, there's a reliability issue. Like suppose you're, uh, suppose you're a pilot and you're gonna fly over a uh, air defense missile that could shoot you down. And I tell you, don't worry, I hacked that air defense missile system. So you 